degree at Nottingham, then a PhD at Imperial, then I buggered off to San Francisco to do uh, cancer research, uh, and then I decided that actually looking at the data and writing programs to look at the data was more interesting than sitting there putting small amounts of liquid into lots of tubes that looked identical. Uh, part of that was down to the fact that I was really bad at remembering which tube I'd already put the liquid in. Uh, and it was impossible to tell because you're talking like 10 microliters, which is not very much, and even in a quite a small tube. Uh, uh, and so th three hours later or three weeks later or three months later, you'd find out that you'd done it wrong and you'd have to start again. Whereas at least with software, you kind of had a slightly shorter development cycle. Plus, you know, writing code, interesting. So um, so that's my potted history. Eventually, uh, like I say, via bioinformatics and then um, manufacturing systems, uh, and then telecoms, I landed at Sky Betting and Gaming, which um, again, like, I don't seem to be very good at picking a particular industry, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so what's Sky Betting and Gaming? Um, yeah. There we go. Right. I'm being sabotaged. <laughs> Who's Skybet? Right. Uh, we're the fourth largest uh, online bookmaker and uh, gaming operator in the UK. Uh, we used to be part of Sky, uh, but we're not anymore. So uh, anybody that doesn't want to work for a really large enterprise but does want to work for us, don't get confused. Uh, anybody that does want to work for a really large enterprise and want to work for gaming, feel free to stay confused. Uh, that's fine. Um, we were sold off to CVC last March, so this is approximately our one first birthday as an independent company, uh, again. Uh, there's about 320 of us in the tech team at the moment. Uh, we expect by this time next year to have 500 and 600 about the year after that. The majority of us are in Leeds. Uh, we've got a small operation in Sheffield now, about 150 people, uh, an even smaller one of about 50 in London, in Hammersmith. Uh, and an even smaller one, which isn't uh, technical at all, uh, in Rome uh, as well. And so what are our products? Well, we've got a range of different products around betting and gaming. We have the obvious skybet.com website, which is about sports book, sports betting primarily. Uh, though you can bet on all sorts of things, like who's going to be killed next on EastEnders or something like that. Uh, we have Vegas, Casino, Bingo and Poker. Uh, which is various different ways of gambling. Um, I'm guessing that most of you kind of know roughly what those are, so I'm not going to bother, particularly as half of you have been to Vegas recently. So uh, I don't need to introduce quite as much of this as I might have to. Um, and we have a bunch of free-to-play products. So we have Super 6, Fantasy Football, uh, and uh, our new Daily Fantasy product. Now these are all Sky Sports branded, so we still have this relationship with Sky that allows us to brand things as Sky and work with them, which is really important to our business model. Uh, but uh, we're quite unusual in terms of the big gambling operators to have this free-to-play uh, introduction uh, acquisition channel uh, that are really popular. So a little bit more background. The last five years with Skybet, we've been growing very quickly. Um, if you look at our monthly transactions, this is what they look like. Um, and if I was showing you the most recent ones, it would be going up more. Uh, so 30 to 40% year-on-year growth pretty much every year for the last five years, uh, averaging out. Um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting ride, I think is probably the best way of saying it. Uh, if you look at our page views um, and uniques, you'll see that page views have grown quite a lot over this time. We've gone from sort of 18 million 12 years ago up to 144 million a month. Um, but interestingly, our kind of uniques haven't grown as quickly as that. So we're seeing greater engagement, more time on the site, people using features more. So this is an important thing from a technical perspective about how we drive engagement, but it's also it's like a load thing. People are sitting on the site for longer doing more. And monthly stats, you know, unless you're kind of Google or Facebook, those numbers are never going to be very impressive to anybody these days. So, um, and they're just not that meaningful either. So uh, let's go to a slightly smaller window of time, a day in the life of Skybet. So betting in particular is really driven 
by what's happening in the real world. Um, some of the other products are a bit. I mean, like if it's raining, poker goes up because people don't want to go out. Um, but but betting is all about actually the sports. So it's focused on a Saturday afternoon in the UK because football is really popular and we over-index on football compared to some operators. Um, and because of the time with Sky Sports, again, football. And, and we have this effect that is the Jeff effect that's associated with Super 6. And what this basically means is our traffic looks like this on a Saturday morning. Now this is our Super 6 uh, kind of graph for logins and predictions. Now you'll see these kind of nasty looking spikes during the, during the morning. Here, here, and here. Uh, this is when Jeff says, go put your Super 6 entries in. Uh, and it is literally exactly that. The guy on TV says, go to Super 6 and put your entries in, and we go triple our login rate in maybe 10 seconds, which is not fun at times. <laughs> but the marketing guys like it. Um, if you sort of zoom out a bit and look at kind of the, the, the wider morning, um, this is, this is sort of logins and uh, bets, with the top being bets. You see this kind of fairly smooth general trend of things getting busier and busier and busier towards three o'clock. But if you look more sort of closely at the individual um, areas in the graph around sort of 12 o'clock, you'll see the sort of 12.45 12.45 game kicking off and it sort of just drops a little bit. Then you'll see various times kind of in the early afternoon when we get mentioned on TV or adverts come on which are associated with these sort of spiky behavior. And then at three o'clock you see this kind of cliff edge. And this is the game starting. Okay. So everybody's trying to get their bets on before the matches start. Now you can still bet afterwards. This is called live betting as opposed to pre-live betting, but people want to get their bets on typically before the matches start. And so everybody's logging in, rushing to get in before three o'clock. So we have this artificial kind of thing that basically says, hey, everybody come to our site at this particular time. It'd be awesome, honest, I promise. Um, and then it dies and then it sort of gradually picks up again. And if you look at the login rate, actually it stays a bit more static because people want to watch their bets and see what's happening. Um, and again, just to talk about growth a little bit more, because it's a key part of our story really is growth. This peak in the late afternoon, this is five o'clock, this is when the matches finish. So this is people coming back to check what the results of their bets were and to place bets on the next match on the evening game. Okay. Um, now that peak there of around about 60 bets a second is 400% of our peak bets per second on Boxing Day 2013. Now, Boxing Day is probably one of the three top days in the year for betting because people are with their families and they want to get away. Uh, and it's that or watch repeats of the Queen or something. Uh, now, if you look at that particular day, actually, that's you know two-thirds of the peak for that particular Saturday. And this is a not particularly busy Saturday, actually. This is kind of fairly run-of-the-mill and possibly a bit quiet. Our current record is twice that record for that day. So, um, you know, scaling is a huge problem for us. Constant scaling is just the real theme. So, and again, just uh, one other thing. Uh, all of those graphs are our sort of bucket, 10 second buckets. So bets per second averaged over 10 seconds, which as we all know, can be kind of misleading. So actually, if you look at actual per second statistics, it's more like 1200 bets a second, which is quite scary, but we try not to think about that number. Um, so that's that's enough background. Let's get into something that's actually kind of vaguely relevant to AWS. So actually, as a business, we don't use AWS very much yet. Uh, we are almost entirely on-premise stuff, although when I say on-premise, I mean um, a data center in Guernsey. Uh, and the, the reasons for this are, are partly historical. That's where the business has always hosted their stuff. Uh, for regulatory and tax and compliance reasons. We were originally regulated by the Aldenley Gaming Commission. Um, and uh, it's quite difficult to move some of that stuff out of Guernsey uh, for, for these reasons. Now, it's getting easier and easier over the next few years, and we expect that to t change quite dramatically over the next few years. But from a historical perspective, that's where we were. Um, some of our existing architecture, some of our vendors built things that just don't really map terribly well to the cloud. Uh, you know, at the back end, we've got a 40 core Infamix database. Um, actually, we've got three of them, but let's not talk about that. Um, uh, that's, that's not really what you want to be running on, on AWS if you can avoid it. So 
and, and we know how to run stuff on premise. We know how to run tin. We know how to run VMware. Uh, you know, we can do that. So lots of reasons to kind of stay where we are, but we're not doing that. So why why AWS? And these are kind of really kind of generic answers, but they they apply to I think almost everybody. It's agility. It's uh, scaling. It's problem workloads that don't fit what you've already got. It's and I think. <laughs> Those are kind of the short-term reasons, but the long-term reason is, well, if you look to the future and, and the economies of scale that cloud brings to their development process, do you want to be left behind on your own on-premise environment, or do you want to leverage those economies of scale, that, that innovation that's happening on the cloud providers? And I firmly believe that if you're not at least preparing yourself for that world, then in a few years' time, your competitors who have been will be starting to leave, leave you behind. Uh, so, push. This is one of our problem workloads. So, uh, our website has a lot of uh, prices on op betting opportunities on it, and those betting opportunities have prices, and those prices change. So, for those of you that aren't too familiar, um, when I say prices, what I mean is odds—the sort of uh, the how much you'll get back if you place a bet on this thing. And these change depending on the condition of the match or uh, that kind of thing. And the push service keeps this up to date. And this is important because the, change, the prices change a lot, particularly when you're talking about live betting. Um, and you can't place a bet with an out-of-date price. The back end will reject the bet placement attempt because essentially you'll be buying something at the wrong price. You'll, you, you're not getting back what you expect if that bet wins. And so in the, in the corner here, you can see there's a price that's been updated via the push platform. It's gone green because the price has got longer, which we after long arguments with the UX people decided was a better thing because you've got more money as opposed to a worse thing because you are less likely to actually win the bet. Uh, but anyway, so that that's how that works. This is the push system and also the kind of the scoreboard. So this was a screenshot from yesterday evening uh, when Japan were in the middle of a game and were having a dangerous attack, which is apparently a really good way of watching a football match. Um, so this is our kind of current uh, push architecture uh, in, in box form. Essentially, we have a Node.js process called Repto MySQL, which does a bunch of different jobs, but it basically consumes information from our backend uh, model of the betting opportunities. And it does some processing on those things. A bit of does a bit of denormalization. Um, and one of the things it does is, is send out a stream of change events to various other services. And one of those other services is the push service. Now, that push service is a bunch of Node.js processes using socket IO, uh, sitting behind an F5, talking to a whole bunch of browsers or HTML5 apps that are really just browsers. And, and this works, and this has worked fine for ages, and it's relatively straightforward. But if you think about um, our site, when the prices change at 3 o'clock, and there's a lot of change at around 3 o'clock, or when a few goals go in at the same time, there can be a lot of change on the site. So when we've got a lot of customers on the site, we can send a lot of messages to a lot of customers. And if you add up all those messages, it gets to about 640,000 messages a second at times that we send out. And we typically have, on a, on a sort of Saturday, around about 150,000 connected clients concurrently on our website. So these are people that are sitting on our website, perhaps browsing from page to page, perhaps watching um, some aspect of the site that's showing them the progress of their bets or something like that, but we are giving them updates on the prices that they could bet on. So unlike a lot of sites where people kind of come, do something and go away, people sit on our site. So this is all done by 16 service workers, and they process about 145 million events in a, on a Saturday, and that works out as about 1.8 billion messages sent to clients. Um, and the thing with that is, it's, that's per day, but actually, probably three quarters of them are in about a four hour window. So the rates are pretty high. Uh, and we actually currently have our most popular site in terms of number of customers, which is Super6, which is really popular partly because it's free. You know, it's free to enter, and you can win 250,000 pounds. People like that. Uh, uh, but we can't, and it has, you know, cross-sell on it. It's got betting opportunities on it. That's its point. Um, and, uh, you know, we get hundreds of thousands of people coming to that on a Saturday because it gets about a million, pa million entries a week. So if we had push turned on to that, 
we probably have, I don't know, two, maybe three times as many connected clients, um, probably 50 to 200 percent of the actual total messages sent, depending on uh, the time of day. Uh, so uh, this isn't great. So people often ask at this sort of point, well, why are you doing this yourself? It doesn't really feel like a core competency. There's, there's companies out there that do this sort of thing for you. So um, PubNub are an example of that sort of company, and they have this big thing on their website that says they do 1.8 trillion messages a month. And actually that number's gone up a lot recently because it wasn't long ago that it was actually less than we sent. Um, but even now, uh, we'd send a probably more than 1%, probably about 2% of their total traffic in terms of messages. And we expect that our traffic is far spikier than most of their stuff because if you look at their reference clients, it's not this sort of stuff for the most part. So um, this kind of makes us nervous. We want to own this, make sure it works. It's, it's right in the line of fire for actually customers being able to transact with us. Uh, but it melts the load balancers. So um, the F5s, uh, which unfortunately, for historical Sky reasons, we were sharing with Sky, um, were melting. Uh, so this was kind of December and January, and we were hitting kind of 80% on, on the F5 CPUs, probably higher at times, and it was just, we were losing connections, push wasn't working, um, so this wasn't good. So uh, a lot of this was down to SSL decryption on the F5s, so um, our short-term fix was run a lot of stunnel. <laughs> so we've got a bunch of sort of compute running somewhat idle behind the F5s, so let's run a lot of stunnel, uh, which works. Uh, and you can see, less CPU on the F5s. Uh, so we even gave some CPUs back to the other project that was complaining to us. Um, but let's face it, this is kind of lame. So um, there's a few problems. First of all, you know, running it through this load balancer wasn't great. Single point of failure, even with the F5 being balanced. Um, but also huge amounts of bandwidth going into our data center and things like that. It's just a pain to operate out of the same places you're operating everything else. Uh, so. Finally, we get to AWS, which is kind of the point of the meeting, I guess. Um, but this is our new push architecture. Uh, it's broadly similar to our old push architecture in version one, but it will probably change more in version two. This was essentially a lift and shift for the most part. So we still have our Rabbit MQs that are providing the kind of fan out capability for these messages. We have a bunch of node processes that are essentially the same as the node processes that we were running on premises. Uh, we then have HA proxies and uh, sitting behind ELB and then the gateways. Now, people will immediately say, why the hell are you running HA proxy there? Uh, and the answer is because the ELBs don't support IP-based session affinity. Uh, so basically, because we could do this, that was how it was always designed. So essentially, the uh, push services keep track of where the clients are in the, in the stack of messages they've got to send, so they don't send the messages again and they keep track of a certain, each one keeps track of a few thousand clients each. Um, but that means that you need to reconnect back to the same push service, otherwise you get a whole bunch of duplicate messages pushed at you. Um, now, there are plenty of ways to refactor this, to remove this dependency, but basically due to urgency, we wanted to get this out of our DC and off our F5s. Um, so to begin with, we've got HA proxy in there, and then we will gradually refactor it to get rid of that. Um, testing this, uh, which is, uh, I think, a significant point to raise. Um, firstly, remember to ask permission. Um, these days, that's quite important with AWS. Um, they're, they're watching out for these kind of simulated events. Um, we run a fleet of load injectors in another VPC, and we're gradually stepping this up to the point that we can run 600,000 connected clients with that, that push volume of messages. Uh, now, it turned out, because basically everything else is fairly simple to scale horizontally, most of our effort to scaling up to 600,000, once we'd got rid of the F5s, uh, went into tuning HA proxy sessions. Uh, so at this point, I just wanted to sort of break slightly to the left and talk about how we run things in, in AWS. Now, as a big, uh, reasonably big company with a fairly large established sort of estate, it's really tempting to go into AWS and just run stuff the way you always have. You know, you sort of throw up a VPC, you get some virtual Fortinets, 
uh, you know, you step back in front, uh, your security team control the perimeter, and uh, yeah, no, we're not doing that. So it's kind of quite important to throw away a lot of us, your assumptions about how you should run a VPC, because it is different. Work out what the way you should do it for this, and don't try and run it the same way. But there are some things that are similar. So we leverage some of our existing infrastructure. We've got a lot of Chef in our organization. Uh, we do a lot of automation through that. And we have automation jobs for doing things like creating a new Chef organization. You want to spin up a new service? You might want a Chef organization to, to run the configuration for that. So it's just a Jenkins job. Um, and so in the Amazon world, we now have a Jenkins job that creates a VPC for you. Uh, and this is our sort of generic VPC. This is what that, that, that Jenkins job produces for you. Now, we are a company that wants some level of control over our accounts. We don't want to just sort of hand out accounts to all of our different teams around the business and let them do whatever they want. Um, there's customer data, there's compliance. We need some level of control. So the way we're approaching that is every, DM, e, e, every VPC essentially has a DMZ uh, network and that DMZ network is essentially operated by the platform services team. But all that is in that DMZ is the sort of SSH bastion, the NAT host, and that's about it really. Um, and that peers to a shared services VPC that is also operated by our things, and that's where things like vulnerability scanners live and things like that. And then those tribe-owned subnets behind the DMZ are basically up to the tribe to do what they want with. And rather than trying to write lots of complicated IAM roles and things like this to really tightly tie this down, and, and to be honest, in some places you just can't because the, the, the widgets aren't there, um, we're mostly leaning towards using config and config rules to tell us when people break policy as opposed to enforce it. And so essentially in this shared VPC, we have a few different things. They sort of support the base networking. They support the IAM roles. The they actually control the kind of root account, but give out fairly powerful users to users. Um, Jenkins to build AMIs, uh, DMZ subsets, the SSH bastion, like I said, and we use console as this kind of intermediary to show to share state between uh, things like the Chef organization that's running in the VP in the shared services VPC and whatever services you might want to run, um, and then. Actually, we're increasingly using console for service discovery even within the VPC as well, although that would be separate. So that's that was just a quick diversion into how we want to operate in there. Um, and now I just want to go back to what we're using it for. So we talked about push, which, whilst it's quite big numbers, is a fairly generic run some stuff in EC2 product. Uh, so I want to talk about cash out, which also has some fairly big numbers and is not an EC2 thing. So what is cash out? So I'm going to assume that most of you don't know what this is. But basically, uh, you can place a bet on something at some point, and you'll be given a price and an expected return. So in this case, I was putting 50p on Southend to beat Sheffield United, um, and that would have returned me £1.45 if Southend should beat Sheffield United. Um, and then you have this notion of cash out. Maybe I've lost faith in, uh, in, in Southend. I no longer believe they're going to win, and I want my money back. Uh, now, before the match was even started, I could get my money back, 48p of it. That'd be a you know a bit of a margin for us because uh, we're a business after all. But um, you know you can have your money back. Uh, but after the match starts, this is still possible potentially, and the amount of money you get back depends on the state of your bet. So um, I'm going to just go back to my laptop for a second. So here. Uh, if I move it onto the screen, rather than just talking to myself, is the cash out service. So uh, essentially, this is a different bet. This is a treble. Uh, apparently, I'm really bad at betting by the looks of it. So basically, I put 10p on the bet. The potential return was 69p. I could have won 69. I'm a big better. Um, now, at the moment, I, they're offering me cashing out for nothing. This is not a good sign. Uh, and in fact, if you look below, you can see that, well, one of my bets, the one at the bottom that's just updated, is green. That means that I'm winning that one, and because Sao JK Lagri are currently 5-1 up against FC Kose. 
Uh, you can bet on a lot of different things. Um, but unfortunately, SD Almazan and Sporting Uxuma are drawing, and uh, Zwickau have totally let me down. So, um, you know, I could cash out here, but there'd be no point. I was sort of hoping when I set this up before that I'd be, you know, able to cash out for a profit, um, or at least for something. But uh, yeah, not so much. Oh well. Uh, this is a really engaging part of our product now. It's really important, um, and it's completely changed the behavior of the customers. Uh, they they spend so much more time on the website than 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 they used to, so um, quick uh, sideline into into architectural patterns. We use CQRS quite a lot, um, so this is command query response separation. So essentially, lots of our systems we have commands going in way and in one way, and then we have a separate system optimized to uh, provide a response. And this is a good way of scaling out when your read loads do different types of work to your write loads. And uh, placing a bet and cash out work a lot like this. So essentially you have one side of the system, which is placing a bet. This sort of funnels through our website into a back-end system, into the Infomix. And then we have a stream of events that come out called the activity feed, uh, and we store those in Couchbase. And then we have something essentially that gets the recent bets. That's that bet tracker thing that I was showing you a moment ago. This shows you what your recent bets are. Um, by this customer data service that hits Couchbase. And then there's another service that calculates the value of that bet, what we will offer you to cash out. Okay? Um, and that cash out value is recalculated every time the price changes. So when you saw on that web page a moment ago that the selection changed, it would recalculate the value that they would be willing to offer. Now people sit there with this open on their computer whilst they're watching. This is one of the things that drives the change in behavior. This is what is causing a big spike in those connected users. So this cash out calculator, so these are API requests to our cash out calculation API on a couple of consecutive Saturdays. And we were hitting this kind of 15,000 to roughly kind of limit. Um, and essentially what was happening here was we were hitting the traffic manager CPU limit. So this is a, a, bun a bunch of steel apps, and they were all hitting their CPU limit. So we did the obvious thing and added more of them. <laughs> Threw tin at the problem. So this took us from 10 traffic managers to 20. Uh, and actually, the second week, well, uh, the week we did that, it was it was relatively quiet for a couple of weeks. It wasn't wasn't that busy. Uh, but the weeks after were a bit busier. And so at this point, we're doing kind of 50,000 API requests a second at peak. And frankly, that was um, just keeping everything really, really, really hot. Uh, and uh, so we looked at a software solution. And, and actually, there was one. Because one of the problems is that everybody gets these price updates at the same time. So everybody makes a request to the API at the same time. So we did this, you know, 640,000 requests, you know, message updates go out in a second, and half of them generate an uh, API request coming back, which is bad, right? So we introduced some jitter, which flattened this down to about 15,000 again. But that was kind of OK for now, but we knew that this was going to grow, right? We were offering it on more sports. We are getting more customers. Um, there was no question that this was going to continue to grow, so we wanted a different solution. So enter Lambda. Uh, this is the AWS stack, really, for, for cash out. Uh, the client kind of knows all the information that needs to be input into the cash out calculation. It knows how much the customer staked. It knows what the current prices are for the bet. And you know, as part of the information that we give that page, it knows what the bet was placed at. This is all the information you need to do this calculation. Uh, so essentially, we can send that information to Lambda and do the calculation. Now. Actually, Lambda isn't quite that simple because it boils down to actually that, which is so Lambda, when you're doing requests from, from kind of a, a browser, actually you go through CloudFront and then API Gateway and then you hit Lambda. And that's an important point when you're talking about these kind of traffic numbers. So hitting 100,000 transactions per second, this was our target performance for this service. Turns out, that's not quite as easy as the architectural diagram makes it sound. 
So firstly, I mentioned this earlier, get permission. Uh, so one of the things that uh, the kind of docs say is that you're allowed to test against things like EC2 and things like that, but not Lambda. Okay, so uh, actually it turns out that, uh, so just before I get on to the specifics, um, simulated events here, this includes general kind of like load testing, but Amazon are quite vague about what they really mean is what's normal, what's simulated, what's bigger, wh when should you tell them. Um, the advice we've been given is basically tell them and it's fairly easy to tell them and they'll cooperate uh, and then you won't get the nasty email from the uh, abuse PT. Uh, th I, I just wanted to call this out. Other simulated events, it's got a list of things that you can, uh, that might be simulated events. Some of them are kind of obvious war games, uh, blue-green testing, whatever. Uh, and brilliantly, other simulated events are an example of s other simulated events, which is just awesome. Uh, which is apparently the one that we came under when we wanted to do load testing. Uh, so anyway, yeah, email email those guys um, uh, and they'll help you out. Uh, but actually, also, if you do have an account manager or solution architect supporting you, you've got a technical uh, rep or something like that, talk to those guys because they will make this process much easier. They'll facilitate this. And uh, it was a lot easier to do that through them than it would have been on our own. Uh, so scaling Lambda from the web. Uh, so con default concurrency limit for Lambda when you create an account is 100, uh, which wasn't going to get us very far. Uh, API Gateway has some limits as well, which aren't all that high by default. And let's frank it, if you throw 100,000 transactions a second at CloudFront without warning, it's probably going to think you're a DDoS or a DOS. So like I say, work closely with the AWS team. Uh, the way this, this works is that uh, basically up to about 25,000 transactions a second, you can inject the load. Uh, obviously, you talk to them, you arrange it, uh, but you can inject the load from a relatively small number of your own uh, EC2 instances or whatever. Uh, and then to get to 100,000, uh, basically Amazon will uh, run that test for you from their own kind of fleet of load injectors, so it's a more global fleet that keeps CloudFront happier, basically. Um, so this is a kind of output from uh, AB because uh, it is that simple to load test. Uh, this was at 200, so this was before we got our limits raised, basically. And you can see that uh, we submitted 10,000 requests and roughly half of them failed, which is awesome, the limit works. Uh, and we did about 1,500 requests a second, which wasn't awesome when we were aiming for 100,000. Uh, but so you'll get a few different errors out of out of this uh, stack. So if you're throttled by Lambda, you'll usually get 500s from that that seem to come from API Gateway. Uh, if you're throttled by API Gateway, you'll get 429s. Uh, but also, if you're throttled by uh, CloudFront, you'll also get 429s. Uh, and this is an example down here at the bottom. Sorry, it's probably a bit low for some of the people at the back, uh, but you do actually get some extra information in the requ in, in the response. So there's this X Amazon error type, too many requests, an X cache error from Cloud. Uh, you know, you can start digging into this and it gives you some clues about where you're getting throttled, basically. Um, and and this is kind of, sorry, actually, before I, I go on to that, um, stepping up through these levels of, of limits is where it's really helpful to have, have somebody on, kind of on the inside helping you. Uh, because when you're doing it through tickets, Quite a few of these teams are in the States. You raise a ticket, you wait a few hours, they wake up, they do it. By that time, you've kind of gone home, then you do your stuff the next day, and it's just, you know, it's a little bit slow. Um, whereas, actually, when you kind of get everybody on a conference call in the evening and you just get it done, you can kind of crack through this pretty quickly. Everybody's pretty keen to help. Uh, so, this is some. Uh, graphs just to show that it, it does actually work. Obviously these are a little small and hard to see from the back so here's kind of a zoomed in on the business end of things. So this just shows that we're doing 100,000 requests a second, that's like five point, like kind of almost six million a minute. Uh, now interestingly we get this quite high latency on some of the requests so we're getting up to about five seconds of latency on some of them but it is actually a quite small number of them at this point um, and as you can see, you get these sort of lambda errors that are gradually climbing, and that graph looks quite scary until you realize that's 75 a second when you're running 100,000 a second into it, uh, which isn't so bad. Now, actually, both the latency 
and some of those lambda errors have been traced back to to an issue that has since been resolved on kind of AWS side, um, which is quite nice. Uh, so this, they, these guys were quite keen to help because this is quite a edge case you, um, in terms of kind of load and pattern for those guys. So they were they were motivated to help. Uh, so. As I said, we, we don't use much AWS really at Skybet, but that's changing. Both of these services are going live this week, uh, or possibly next week, depending on change control and such like. But hopefully this week. Uh, um, I was kind of hoping they'd already be live, so I could like say they were live, but sadly not. Um, and one of the motivations for this is is the Grand National, and this is kind of uh, the, the, the big part of our scaling story again. So the Grand National is the biggest betting event in the UK, high street online. It's insane, right? Everybody, well, not everybody, but like people that never bet do bet on the Grand National. So we get, it's a huge stress test for the online bookies. Like if you actually go to the online bookies in the, on the afternoon of the 9th, you know, there's a reasonable chance that several of them will have fallen over. Hopefully not us, but several of them will have done. Um, and it happens every year because the the load is just insane. You get this huge wave of people coming in to try and place their bets just before the race starts. Uh, and then you get this huge wave of completely clueless punters who never bet, don't understand who they bet on, don't remember who they bet on, don't know which horse was which. And they just want to come into account history and see whether they've won. right? Except account history is the slowest API in the world. It's terrible. Um, so which is a whole other story. But uh, yeah, so it's a pain. But a huge amount of our year is around this. And so for uh, a week on Saturday, we're hoping that AWS will be taking a really big part of the load on two of these really key services for us. Uh, and so that's the story of our next week, is to make sure that those are working, happy, and help us through the Grand National. That's it. Great, Michael. Thanks very much for that. Uh, anybody got any questions at all? Get the mic. Operating in Ireland, uh, we might be exposed to a 1% turnover tax, which isn't actually active, but is there. Uh, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, they currently have no regulation, but are expected to have regulation soon. Um, Germany has just had their regulation struck down and it's illegal to operate gaming but it's legal to operate bets so like, we have it's really spotty around Europe everybody has different rules the Italians have different rules like so it's really difficult to operate um, kind of generically in all these different places now actually for the most part mostly what they care about is the, the sort of system of record so you can build quite a lot of the front end in these different different areas um, uh, and it is improving gradually. Uh, but yeah, so it's a mixture of different things. The other part of the question was if you had any plans to uh, use services such as OpenStack in Guernsey that allowed for AWS APIs. Uh, so at the moment, um, we're currently fairly embedded with VMware on our on-premise stuff. Uh, we are driving that in an automated way. We're looking at using Terraform to drive that as well, which we're currently using to drive uh, a lot of our AWS stuff, uh, which would give us some level of abstraction across that. Uh, we don't know exactly what we're going to do with our VMware estate in the medium term yet. Uh, op one option is OpenStack. Another option is to go more around some kind of container uh, solution uh, on, on, on bare metal rather than direct virtualization. So, uh, have you looked into <coughs> uh, DSR, uh, direct server res uh, responses from your current stack to solve the problem of F5 going too hot? And the second question is, uh, have you looked into HTTP2 uh, push from server side? Uh, so, in terms of, <sighs> so I mean, yeah, we could we could take the the, the load balancers out of the stack. Yes, um, at the moment the applications are all essentially configured to hit. Uh, kind of a, a DNS name, basically, and it, we'd have to make application changes probably to spread that load out in some way, or DNS round robin, or something. Uh, but 
uh, where it's currently hosted, because it's a shared service area with Sky, we don't have the control to allow that. We could move it onto the onto Guernsey, where we would have the ability to do that. But there, we'd be uh, concerned about the bandwidth onto the island, because actually there aren't that many uh, links onto the island. The bandwidth is expensive, so we'd prefer to keep it offshore from off the island. Uh, and rather than standing up another data center just for this. Great, thank you so much. If I give uh, Michael a round.